Theravada Buddhism is often criticized for being selfish. We're not here to save all beings, we're here to save our own skin. That's what they say. And it is true that we recognize that each of us is making ourselves suffer, and we have to work on putting an end to that suffering ourselves. Each of us has our own karma. You can't take your karma and give it to somebody else. So it looks like we're just working on our own, our own goodness, our own happiness. But when you think about goodness, it's not the sort of thing that is limited just to you. And the goodness you do is going to spill out into the lives of other people. There's that image the Buddha gives of the two acrobats. One acrobat is standing on the top of a bamboo pole. Another acrobat is standing on top of his shoulders. And he says to her, you look out after me and I'll look out after you, and that way we'll maintain our balance and come down safely from the pole. And she said, no, that doesn't work. You have to look after yourself and I look after myself, and that way we help each other maintain our balance and come down safely from the pole. And as the Buddha said, what she said at that point was right. That it's in maintaining your balance, you help other people maintain theirs. He says, when you're working on developing the establishing of mindfulness, other people benefit. In the same way that when you're kind and generous and patient with others, develop, develop equanimity in your dealings with other people, it would seem that they are the first beneficiaries, but at the same time you benefit as well. So Theravada rejects the idea that there's a clear line between your well-being and the well-being of others. If you do things that are really meritorious, the word bunya, I'd like to find a much better translation for that. Meritorious sounds like merit badges and Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, brownie points. But there's a goodness to the types of actions that we work on. As the Buddha said, genuine happiness comes from doing good. He says the word doing good, making merit here, is another word for happiness. And it's a happiness that spreads around. It's not like the happiness that comes, say, from wealth or status or praise or sensual pleasures, because a lot of times that happiness means that when you gain something, somebody else has to lose. When they gain, you have to lose. That kind of happiness actually builds divisions. And so the person who's experiencing that kind of happiness, even though they, they may think of sharing some of it with others, still it's pretty much their experience, and that's as far as it goes. And oftentimes in trying to experience that happiness, it's not just that other people lose out on not experiencing that happiness, they actually suffer. Because a lot of times what people are looking for that kind of happiness, they do all kinds of unskillful things to attain it. We can think of a lot of people who gain their wealth in nefarious ways, gain their status in unfair ways. People who are praised by the world and you look at their behavior and it's not the kind of thing you would want to praise. But it happens. And so those things can be gained by unskillful methods. But goodness, that has to be gained by skillful methods. And other people benefit at the same time. There are the two ways they benefit. One is automatically, if you have less greed, aversion, and delusion in your mind, you're not the only one who's going to benefit from that. Other people will benefit from the fact that they're not the victims of your greed, aversion, and delusion anymore. And there are other times when you have to be more conscious of what you're doing to spread that goodness to others. We're talking today about dedicating merit, and that's a very important way of expanding the goodness of your meditation, the goodness of your generosity, the goodness of your virtue, in all directions. A Brahmin once came to see the Buddha and asked him, we Brahmins dedicate the goodness of our actions to our dead ancestors. And what does the Buddha have to say about that? And the Buddha says, yes. 
it can be done. And the Brahmin says, do the ancestors actually get that? Because they were talking about their ancestors. In those days, they would count ancestors going back seven generations. And the Buddha said, if they are hungry ghosts, they automatically get it. Now, it is the case there are some hungry ghosts whose karma is so heavy that they can't receive this kind of dedication. But the fact that when they know that someone has dedicated merit to them, whether it's specifically to them as individuals or as we have that little chant, and they all share in the blessings spring from the good I have done, that's a dedication of merit. When they realize that and they appreciate it, their, their appreciation for that goodness, that's going to be their goodness now. That's how they gain merit, and they feed off of that. Just like the, there are gods, the radiant gods feed off of rapture. The hungry ghosts feed off of dedicated merit. And so at the beginning of the meditation, at the end of the meditation, after a chanting session, Anytime when you've done something good, you might want to stop and think, who are your dead ancestors? Can you dedicate the merit to them? When I first went to practice with John Fuang, it was shortly after my mother had died. And that was one of the first things he said, end of every meditation. Dedicate the merit of your meditation to your mother. It's an integral part of the practice to remind you that you shouldn't be the only one benefiting from this. The benefits should go all around. That Brahman then asked the Buddha, what if you don't have any dead ancestors who are, who are hungry ghosts? And the Buddha said, don't worry, everybody has dead ancestors who are hungry ghosts. Again, counting back seven generations, that's a lot of people. There are going to be some hungry ghosts in there. And you don't have, of course, limited to your ancestors, anybody that you've had any contact with. There's a concept they have in Thailand of what they call chao kam ne wain. I mean, the people you've wronged in the past, especially the ones who are really fixated on that. You've got to repay them. These are people we don't like to think about, the people we've wronged. We like to think that we've gone through life, or through our many lives, just being very helpful and good and kind. But who knows what we have in our, in our past? When you look at a person in the present moment, it's not the case that you see the running balance in their karma account. All you see are the past actions that are sprouting right now, they are giving fruit right now. As for other actions, they are in your field. The seeds are there in the field, and they may sprout some other time. You don't know what they are. Our memory, for the most part, extends back just into this lifetime. When you think about all the many lives you've been around. There are probably some times when you did something that was not all that skillful, and there may be somebody who's really fixated on having been the victim of what you did. So dedicate merit to them. Now the problem, as I said, with some hungry ghosts is their karma may be so strong that they are not yet in a position where they can be aware of the fact that merit's being dedicated to them. And there are also those that are just hold a grudge. There was a woman who came to meditate at the monastery several years back when John Fuang was still alive. She was a friend of the, one of the women who cooked in the kitchen. And uh, the woman in the kitchen had told John Fuang that this friend had a particular problem. Every time she tried to meditate, her body would start shaking uncontrollably. So that night she was meditating there with us in the jetty, and sure enough, she started shaking. And John Fuang had a student who was quite psychic. and. He told her to look at what was happening, and the woman saw this two beings behind the woman shaking her. And to make a very long story short, she found out these had been the parents of this woman in a previous lifetime. She killed them in that lifetime. This was a long time ago. And they didn't like the idea that she was going to get away, that by meditating she could get out of their grasp. And she, was, she asked them, what would you want? What would satisfy you? And they said that she helped build a Buddha image and dedicate the merit to us. That would satisfy them. It turned out we were building a Buddha image at the monastery at the time. So John Fuang told the woman, you can't say anything to her about this. Otherwise it looks like we're trying to squeeze money out of her. But a couple of years later, someone 
was building a Buddha image, and she participated in that, and the shaking stopped. So we don't know who we've got in our past, what we've done in our past. So it's always a good idea to dedicate merit, just to pay off some old debts, and as an act of kindness. Especially here in a place like America, where there hasn't been that much dedication of merit to anybody. We have a lot of hungry ghosts. You don't have to look very far, it's just the human beings around us. Lots of them are like hungry ghosts. They never seem to have enough. Everything is lacking, lacking, lacking in their lives. In the murals in Thailand, when they draw hungry ghosts, they have these huge stomachs and these little tiny, tiny mouths. They can never get enough. But in southern Thailand, they actually make a, a sweet, which is very, very thin noodles. The idea that they're thin enough that maybe a hungry ghost could eat them. You give those noodles to, to monks, and then the merit goes to the hungry ghost. Maybe the hungry ghost can eat the very thin noodles. But again, you don't have to look at murals in Thailand. Look around you. There are a lot of people who just never get enough, no matter how much they get. And so what are they, what's going to happen to them when they die? That's pretty much where they're headed. And because there has been that much merit making in America, and very little dedication of merit, there are lots of these hungry ghosts out there that could benefit from our sharing the merit with them. If they're in the position where they can accept it and are willing to accept it, they're going to benefit. And the dedication of merit reminds you also that you want to take the goodness of your meditation and bring it into not only the lives of those who have passed away, but the lives of people around you. And John Fung had another student whose powers of concentration were extremely strong. And after practicing with him for a while, she complained to him. She said, I don't see that this concentration is having any impact on the rest of my life. She tended to have a very strong temper, and her temper wasn't going away. And as he explained to her, it's not the case that simply doing concentration is going to have some sort of magic wand effect on the rest of your life. You have to bring the lessons that you've learned in the meditation, you have to bring the qualities of mind that you developed in the meditation, and consciously bring them to bear on the rest of your life. This is one of the ways you bring the merit of your meditation out and spread it around. So when you leave meditation, don't really leave it. Try to think of the attitudes you've developed. You've had to develop some patience. You've had to develop some equanimity, some kindness for yourself. You've had to develop the ability to hold your thoughts in, in check, to exercise some restraint. Well, try to bring these qualities into your day-to-day -day interactions with other people. Learn some restraint. Learn some equanimity. If you've been meditating properly, you've developed these skills. But don't just leave them on the meditation cushion. Take them along with you. See your interactions at work, your interactions at home, as part of the practice, as your opportunity to spread some of the goodness of the meditation around. This is what it comes down to, is that goodness should not be just for one individual. And if it's really good, it's not. The effects should spread around. Even though each of us has to work on his or her own karma, work on his or straightening out his or her own mind, deal with his or her own defilements, still the results when they come. Don't just stay within your own mind or within your own body. They should come out in your actions. And when they do, other people are going to benefit. At the very least, they receive the goodness that you've, that you've developed. Some people are very sensitive to that. And even better, if they see that you're a good example. And take the case of a John Munn. I mean, people in Thailand at that point were saying that the noble paths and fruitions were impossible. Nobody could do it. Then he b 
by his own example, proved that it was what they were saying was wrong. And as the word got out, more and more people came and practiced with him, and they found that they too could develop the noble attainments. Many of them had given up and believed that this was not possible anymore. It's an example of one person can be inspiring to, inspiring to other people. Remind them there are aspects of the human mind, qualities of the human mind, dimensions and capabilities of the human mind. There are a lot more than we tend to think. And when these possibilities are opened up to us, that's a great gift to us. So if you can act as a good example to others, showing a level of patience and equanimity and kindness and restraint in your actions beyond the ordinary. That's going to be a real gift to others and might inspire them to try to develop the same qualities within them. This is another way in which goodness gets spread around. <laughs>